Amen. That's the Swore family with another cut from their new project entitled Believe For It, and that is He Will Hold Me Fast. Good evening and welcome to Tuesday Night Prophecy. It's Tuesday, May 21st, 2024. I'm Dr. Joseph Speciali, and thankful that you've chosen to make our Tuesday Night Bible Study part of your day whenever it is that you're listening or watching this. And as uh, we were coming on the recording here, I was checking uh, the news feed. And uh, as you're hearing this on Tuesday, we're pre-recording on Monday, and you're hearing this on Tuesday, you're probably all very well aware of this already, but Iran's um, president, um, Ebrahim Rasi, or Rizi, however it's pronounced, is confirmed dead in a helicopter crash that uh, occurred yesterday, along with Iran's foreign minister. And it'll be interesting to see that if uh, blame is placed on Israel for this. I mean, it is entirely possible this was an assassination, either by uh, Mossad or even our intelligence, the CIA, or a combination thereof. We don't know. It's always possible, these types of things. A lot of, lot of things happening. I think uh, a Eastern European leader, I think Slovenia, I think that I think I have the right country there. Slovenia prime minister uh, attempted assassination last week as well, so things are stirring up. It's uh, the environment is uh, very primed for a kinetic regional conflict to break out at this point in Europe, Middle East, and so on. Um, the drumbeats of war are there, and all of this fulfilling prophecy, wars and rumors of wars. And if Iran <clears throat> rightly or unjustly blames Israel uh, for what's happened to their, to their president, um, in the upcoming days and weeks, we might see an escalation between Iran and Israel and their hostilities. Also <clears throat> saw that the International Criminal Court has, uh, is seeking arrest warrants for Hamas, as well as Benjamin Netanyahu for the October 7th terror attack on Israel and, I and Israel's subsequent war against Hamas in Gaza, alleging that war crimes have been committed by both sides. So here we go. I mean, it's, uh, it's just something else, folks. And then Benny Gantz, who's part of the coalition government there in Israel, has given until the first week of June, I think. I, uh, the, the exact date um, fails me at this point, but I know it's in the first week of June. He's given Netanyahu until that date to come up with a very structured, formal plan on what's going to happen after Hamas is defeated. You know, what's the plan for, for Gaza and all of that? Failure to come up with such a plan, and Gantz is going to fold from the coalition government. So... A lot of things happening. Pray for Israel, folks. Pray for Israel. Uh, the devil is at work in our world. The spirit of Antichrist is at work trying to continue to lay the foundation for global governance, global religion, global economy. And all of that is going to happen. There's no question about that. God's word prophesies of it. It is all going to happen but it's supposed to happen after the church is gone. And so while we're still here, this is our watch, and we need to take the attitude into spiritual conflict into spiritual conflict and warfare that this is not going to happen on our watch. Okay, not going to happen. We need to pray the Lord destroy these satanic strongholds, discomfort, and spoil the spirit of Antichrist, especially as it's at work in our country. Uh, we have an election coming up, and no doubt evil forces will be looking to undermine the, the will of the majority of the people in this country who, it's undoubtedly clear, want to return to a historically traditional America and not this progressive Marxist um, abomination that we are being forced to become by very rich and powerful people who are all part of 
a global, a global governance agenda. So we need to pray. We just need to pray, folks. Okay. And speaking of prayer, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and we'll resume our study of the book of Daniel. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you tonight in the precious name of Jesus, we thank you that you hold us fast, that our salvation is was not obtained by merit, it's not retained by merit, um, it's not maintained by merit. Lord, we, we are saved by grace through faith, and we're kept by the power of God, and we thank you for that, Father, for so great a salvation. And Lord, we do pray tonight for the needs of your people out there. We thank you for each one that's joining us virtually here tonight. And uh, pray, Father, you'd meet their needs right where they're at, whatever they might be. We pray especially for lost loved ones to be saved. We pray for the needs of our country, Lord. We pray our leaders would get saved and have hearts that are moldable and pliable to the working of the Holy Spirit that even though they may not even desire to be led by the Spirit of God, they nevertheless be led by you, Lord. As your word promises in Proverbs 21, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord as the rivers of water, and he turneth them whithersoever he will. And we pray you do that, Father. And we pray that you would discomfit all of the plans of the enemy, all of the things that he's currently and, and prospectively undertaking, Lord, to destroy Christian America, and to destroy the nation of Israel. And we pray, Lord, that even though we know the worst of times is yet to come for your chosen people, Israel, that time is not until the time of Jacob's trouble, after the rapture of the church. So, Lord, we pray that you give your people, Israel, final and complete victory over Hamas. We we, we don't relish people dying, Lord, we don't. We pray souls on both sides get saved. That is first and foremost. But we pray that, absent of that, that there be definitive, final victory for your chosen people, Lord. And we pray that our country would stand completely and and, uh, unreservedly behind the nation of Israel, without compromise, Lord, without condition. And we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and jump into our study, Daniel chapter 4. Daniel chapter 4, and this is the deposed despot that we're going to be studying now here in Daniel chapter 4. We've also referenced this as being Nebuchadnezzar's testimony, and it most certainly is. Every single word, as far as I can tell, every single word in Daniel chapter 4 are the words of Nebuchadnezzar given by inspiration of God, penned down. as So as far as we know, um, either the Lord inspired Nebuchadnezzar, and he's the one who actually wrote this scripture, or he inspired Nebuchadnezzar at the moment to speak these words, and then later inspired Daniel to write them down, gave Daniel the full recall, every word that Nebuchadnezzar, under uh, being filled with the Spirit of God, saying these words, so that Daniel was able to record them at a later date. Regardless, um, the words are coming from Nebuchadnezzar, and this is his testimony. In fact, in the chapter, he speaks in the first-person pronoun in one way, shape, or form, whether it's I, me, mine, uh, and that type of thing. You know, first-person pronoun, 52 times. In Daniel 4. Okay. Um, And in verse 36 alone, he speaks in the first person pronoun 11 times in that one verse. And what we're reading here, and we'll see this as we go through verses 1 through 3 in particular, he's sending these words to all people, to all people that dwell in the earth. And it truly is his conversion testimony. After what he experienced in Daniel 2, in Daniel 3, he didn't get immediately saved. But after what happens to him, as he testifies here in Daniel 4, that's what seals the deal for him. And he accepts the God of Daniel as the one true living God. 
This is his conversion testimony. All right, so verse number one, Nebuchadnezzar the king unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied unto you. So we've mentioned before, when we studied Daniel chapter 2, that Nebuchadnezzar did not rule over the entire earth. So he says that he's sending this, this decree, these words, to all nations in all the earth. Well, he didn't rule over all of them, so this is just another way of saying that he is addressing everyone under his domain. And even though Nebuchadnezzar did not rule over the entire earth, we learn from our study of Daniel chapter 2, specifically in verses 37 and 38, that if he wanted to extend his rule to include the entire earth, he could have done that. And God would have given it to him, including all of the beasts, animals. So go back and read verses 37 and 38 of Daniel 2, if you need to, to uh, have support for that idea. But absolutely is the case. And not only with Nebuchadnezzar, but also with, uh, with Cyrus. With Cyrus, King Cyrus, who uh, was the second ruler of the Medo-Persian Empire, he too was given that same type of global authority by God. He never realized all of it, because Cyrus, like Nebuchadnezzar, did not rule over the entire world, but he could have if he so chose to. Ezra 1, verse number 2 says, Thus saith, thus saith tongue twister, Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him in house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So were all the kingdoms of the earth at that time under the rule of Cyrus? The answer is no. But Cyrus knew that God had given him the authority over all the kingdoms of the earth if he so chose to go and get them. And he didn't. Same with Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Now the uh, Schofield Reference Bible here in Daniel 4 verse 1 says the following, Nebuchadnezzar, first of the Gentile world kings in whom the times of the Gentiles began. And that's true. Uh, times of the Gentiles represents that period of time in which Israel is uh, basically without a king. Basically without a king. Uh, the times of the Gentiles, it be, and that's uh, an expression used in Luke 21, 24. Um, and it extends from the time that the temple is destroyed in 587 B.C. and goes all the way to the second coming of Jesus Christ. So Nebuchadnezzar, first of the Gentile world kings in whom the times of the Gentiles began, perfectly comprehended the universality of the sway committed to him. And the scripture cited is Daniel 2, verse 37, 38. As also did Cyrus, scripture cited Ezra 1, verse 2, as we just shared with you. That they did not actually subject the known earth to their sway is true, but they might have done so. The earth lay in their power. So to that note, we agree. Absolutely, that's the case here. So this decree that Nebuchadnezzar is giving, which we are calling his personal testimony, is going out to all under his rule. And he begins by saying, peace be multiplied unto you. What a per, uh, peculiar way to start a decree going to all of your subjects, isn't it? For somebody who's supposed to be a despot, and let's just face it, based on what we've seen about the character of Nebuchadnezzar up until this point in chapters 2 and 3, he was a despot. Uh, he did whatever he wanted to do as ruler. What he said was the way it was. Period. And if anybody looked at him cross-eyed, he'd have their head. And that's just the way it was. So for him to 
address the people with this expression, peace, be multiplied unto you. What's interesting is that this exact expression appears four times in the King James Bible, peace be multiplied, four times, four times. And it's spoken by three different people. Obviously, Nebuchadnezzar the first here in Daniel 4, verse 1. Um, the second time it's spoken is by Darius the Mede in Daniel 6, verse 25. So let's take a look at that. We have the verse up on the screen. Then King Darius wrote unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied unto you. And we'll see when we get to chapter 6. What that is, Darius the Mede is making a proclamation there about the God of Daniel. And it essentially is his conversion testimony that this king, Darius the Mede, who I believe historically corresponds to the sole son of, of uh, oh, well, it's Cyaxares the second, and he was the son of What's his name? Starts with an A. King of the Medes. It escapes me. Maybe it'll come to me before we go, but a, a very well-known king in secular history, the King of the Medes, and it's just escaping me. Just a second here, because I'm not going to let that go. I've got to give you that name there. Uh, hold on just a minute here. Uh, Styages. There you go. I knew it started with an A, Astyages. Yeah, so uh, most of secular history doesn't believe that Astyages had a son. Um, but Xenophon's a historian that believes he did, and he named him Cyaxares II, and he perfectly corresponds, well, just about perfectly corresponds with the biblical Darius the Mede as far as the history and what the Bible says about this man. So uh, I believe he got saved. I do. The Darius the Mede in Daniel 6, I believe, got saved from what he witnessed there in Daniel 6. And so he also addresses the people with this expression, peace be multiplied unto you. You know who else, who the third person is who said those words? And by the way, he said them twice. The Apostle Peter. Both of his epistles, both, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, in verse 2 of each of his epistles, begins with the expression, peace be multiplied unto you. 1 Peter 1, 2, 2 Peter 1, 2. So two converted pagan kings and the apostle Peter, the only ones in the Bible who say, peace be multiplied unto you. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. The expression signs and wonders appears 13 times in our Bible. The reverse of the expression, wonders and signs, appears three times for a total of 16 times. First appearance you'll find in Deuteronomy 6.22. So Nebuchadnezzar regarded the Lord's signs and wonders as great and mighty, as we see in the verse. I thought it good to show the signs and wonders that the high God hath wrought toward me. In verse number three, he says, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. Well, what are the signs and wonders that we know of, at least, that Nebuchadnezzar was exposed to? Well, whatever uh, it was there in Daniel 2, 3, and 4, basically. And in Daniel 2, God enabled Daniel to provide not just the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, but the content of the dream, if you recall. The wise men, of course, were trying to get by with giving Nebuchadnezzar some made-up interpretation once he would convey to them the contents of the dream. But either intentionally or or uh, he truly, he either in, in purposefully told them that he couldn't recall the, green, the dream and was lying to them, or uh, he truly couldn't recall it. And so he knew that they were trying to buy time, that they could not 
um, tell him the content of the dream and that they were probably going to make something up just to, just to placate the king. Well, Daniel not only gave Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation, but the very content of the dream. That's a miracle. Only God knows the thoughts and, and all of that. The devil doesn't know uh, what's going on in our head when, when we're awake or when we're asleep. Okay, but God does. And then in Daniel 3, God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from death and from any harm whatsoever. Not a hair of their head which was singed. The smell of the fire wasn't even upon them as they came out of the burning, fiery furnace. And Nebuchadnezzar actually saw the fourth man, the Son of God, walking in the fire, fellowshipping with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He saw a picture of the gospel. He saw a picture of the salvation that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he, he and he alone has power to deliver us who trust in him from the second death. Nebuchadnezzar saw it. And then in Dan Daniel 4, we'll see that God is going to enable Daniel to once again interpret a dream for Nebuchadnezzar. And the interpretation is going to be fulfilled to the letter. And what that entailed, basically, if we can summarize, is Nebuchadnezzar is going to be deposed from his throne due to his pride and be forced to live like a beast for a period of seven years. Then he's going to be restored to the throne, and he's going to enjoy more excellent majesty than he did prior to being deposed. And all of that conditioned on his repentance, which, of course, he did. Okay? So he sees all these works. He sees the Lord working through and for Daniel. And no doubt he's even got conviction on his own heart every step of the way. We see a progression in how Nebuchadnezzar thinks about the God of Daniel and how he addresses him. And in this testimony, we see that he refers to the Lord as, first of all, in verse number two here, the high God, the high God. In verse 34, he's going to refer to the Lord as the Most High, the Most High. In verse 34, he's also going to refer to him as him that liveth forever. And then in verse 37, as the King of Heaven the King of Heaven, capital K, the King of Heaven. So a, a very notable progression in how he thinks of the Lord. He's not just a revealer of secrets anymore. He's not just, he's not a God of gods and a Lord of kings anymore. Not, not just that, he's so much more than that. He is the Most High. He's he, him that lives forever. He is the King of Heaven. And I believe he he truly accepts in his heart, converts to the Lord as the one true living God. Verse 3, how great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. Um, pretty much what Darius the Mede is going to say as part of his conversion in Daniel 6. If you want to jot down a cross-reference, Daniel 6 and verse number 27. Darius the Mede says about the Lord, he delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth, who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Amen. How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Now we've seen these scriptures before. In Daniel chapter 2, in verse number 44, this is where we first saw this reference about the Lord's kingdom being forever and his dominion being everlasting and so on. Daniel 2, 44, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. At that time, we also cross-reference Daniel 6, 26. Again, this is part of Darius the Mede's testimony. He says, I make a decree 
that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is, here it is, the living God, not a living God, one of many, the living God. The implication there, all the other gods, including the ones I used to worship and my father, Astyages, worshipped, they're not true gods. They're dead. For he is the living God and steadfast forever, and his kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall be even unto the end. And then we have Daniel 7 and verse number 14, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all people and nations and languages should serve him, referring to the Son of Man. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away. His kingdom, that which shall not be destroyed. So there it is. All right, uh, verse number four. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house. So now he begins, after he, after he gives this introduction to the people, he is now going back in time and giving us the history behind his conversion. Okay? I, Nebuchadnezzar, so the first of many personal pronouns in the history that he recounts here, showing us that Nebuchadnezzar is the one speaking here. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. So at the time that this is happening, we gave you the approximate dates, I believe, last time. Um... The events here are taking place over a period of about eight or nine years, so from 570 B.C. through 562 B.C., and we know that seven of those years are taken up with Nebuchadnezzar being deposed from the throne. Um, There is a year between the time of his dream and his actually being deposed from the throne as well. So that's why we place this starting in 570 B.C., uh, shortly after his conquest of Egypt, okay, which took place late 572, early 571 B.C., somewhere in there. Um, Nebuchadnezzar ruled until 561 B.C., so what we know, if these dates are anywhere near correct, is that he is, at this time, that the events of chapter 4 commence here, where he says, I'm at rest in mine house and flourishing in my palace. He's in the last decade of his reign. His work, all but done. His days of conquering lands at this point are over. He, He has no desire. Again, if he had endeavored to do so, any place he would have gone, any place, the Lord would have given it in his hand. So he could have gone north into Europe. He could have gone south into Africa and taken the entire continent of each of them if he so chose. He didn't. He's at rest. After Egypt, that's it. All of the reconstruction and construction efforts, the Ishtar Gate, the Hanging Gardens, the Temple of Marduk, and how about building another part, uh, another section of the city on the other side of the Euphrates River? I mean, all these things we'll, we'll go over in great detail when we get to verse number 30. We'll talk about Nebuchadnezzar's um, construction efforts and how he, he just transformed the glory of Babylon. Okay, but all that was over now. All uh, all the reconstruction or construction projects, with the exception of maybe some minor ones, they're done. They're done. So he's resting. Verse number five, I saw a dream which made me afraid, and the thoughts upon my head, or upon my bed, and the visions of my head troubled me. So the dream which he saw made him afraid. In other words, it's a nightmare. That's what a nightmare is. It's a dream that makes us afraid. So going back to chapter 2 and verse number 1, same thing had happened back then. 
Nebuchadnezzar dreamed dreams wherewith his spirit was troubled, and his sleep break from him. He was having, in his mind, a nightmare. Same thing here. Daniel's going to have a vision, a night vision, in Daniel 7, verse 1, that's going to trouble him. It says in Daniel 7, verse 1, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. And uh, so on. So the expression, made me afraid, appears four times in our King James Bible and refers to the people, the people, in 2 Samuel 14, 15. Uh, It refers to the floods of ungodly men two times. 2 Samuel 22, 5, and Psalm 18, 5. And then the third time, it refers to Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So what made me afraid? When you look at the expression, made me afraid, what are the things that made me afraid? The people, floods of ungodly men, and Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The thoughts upon my bed. Again, very similar to what Nebuchadnezzar experienced in chapter 2. In chapter 2, in verse number 29, Daniel says to Nebuchadnezzar, As for thee, O king, thy thoughts came into thy mind upon thy bed. What should come to pass hereafter? And he that revealeth secrets maketh known to thee what shall come to pass. So we mentioned then, and we'll reiterate it now, Now, what we learn from this is that our thoughts, while we're lying down upon our bed before we fall asleep, often contribute, not always, but often contribute to our dreams. So whatever it is that is going through our mind, whatever it is we're meditating upon, thinking upon, at the moment we lay our heads on our bed, will often contribute to what we dream about. So, if we're thinking about things that concern us, scare us, uh, the prospect of which makes us anxious or depressed, then that will contribute to dreams that all but um, enhance those negative feelings, and those dreams will be nightmares, obviously. So if we're correct here in making this assessment that our thoughts, right before we go to sleep, often contribute to our dreams, then if we want to avoid nightmares, at least as much as possible, we should remember the Lord upon our bed and meditate upon him in the night watches. That is what Psalm 63, 6 prescribes. When I remember thee upon my bed and meditate on thee in the night watches. Or what what Philippians 4 and verse number 8 says, right? Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. And the Lord certainly qualifies as every one of those things. So think on him, think on his word, right? Make sure the Lord is the last thing you're thinking about as you go off to sleep. So listen to scripture being read. Okay? Many Bible apps now on your phone will, uh, as you pull it up, there's an option to listen to it being read uh, via audio. Play scripture. Go to sleep with scripture being read to you. Um, Play gospel music at a low volume. Um, Preaching, teaching. Okay. I will not be offended if you play these lessons while going to sleep and you fall asleep without listening to them in their entirety. If it if it helps you to think on the Lord before you go to sleep, amen to that. Now we hope you'll 
listen to us while you're awake to get uh, to actually meditate and learn something from what we're being taught. But hey, if if it's going to help you sleep well because it puts your mind on the Lord, have at it. Have at it. So we should remember the Lord upon our bed, meditate upon him in the night watches. And uh, we will be doing everything within our power to avoid nightmares, okay? Therefore made I, de- made I a decree to bring in all the wise men of Babylon before me, that they might make known unto me the interpretation of the dream. So here's the wise men again. <laughs> Here are the wise men after all this time. You remember there's five groups of these guys, and verse number seven says, then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. Okay. And I told the dream before them, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. Okay. So there's five of them, and we've got them outlined here. You have the Chaldeans, and that expression appears 12 times in the book of Daniel. First appearance going back to Daniel 1, verse 4. The magicians, they appear seven times. First time, Daniel 1, verse 20. The astrologers, astrologers appears eight times in Daniel. First time, Daniel 1, verse 20. Sorcerers appears just one time. That's in Daniel 2, verse 2. So they're not listed here in Daniel 4. Uh, Then you have the soothsayers appearing four times. First appearance, Daniel 2, verse 27. So five, the number of death. These are five occultic wise men by title in Babylon. Okay? Now, even though at the point in time this dream happens in Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar believed that the spirit of the holy gods was in Daniel, we know that because that's exactly what he's going to testify in verse 9. Let's take a look at that. O Belteshazzar, master of the magicians, because I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. So, Of course, at the time, that's a pretty ignorant statement. We'll comment on that when we get to verse 9. But nevertheless, what we can say is that Nebuchadnezzar truly believed at this point in time, Daniel was special. Daniel had a gift. Daniel had a gift, a divine gift. Okay? In spite of believing that, okay, and the fact that Daniel had a track record, he had already successfully revealed not just the interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's previous dream, but the actual content of it. In chapter 2, verses 31 through 45, in spite of all that, he still calls for these occultic wise men to interpret his dream rather than Daniel. Now, these wise men couldn't interpret Nebuchadnezzar's first dream, and they couldn't interpret this one either as it says at the end of verse 7. So the question is, why did Nebuchadnezzar do this? Why did he call for these wise men, knowing full well, and even though they might be individually different different soothsayers and magicians and astrologers than the ones who he called to come forth in in chapter 2, they could be completely different individuals, yet their positions that they're holding and the character of the people occupying them are the same. They're they're charlatans. They're charlatans. They're like your prosperity gospel preachers today. They're like your mediums of today. They're just taking people for a ride and bilking them with their money. Okay? So he knows they're charlatans. Why is he calling on them? It's a fair question, isn't it? Let me give you a Let me give you a possible reason why he's doing this. I think that he may have suspected that the dream was prophetic, just like his last one in chapter 2. And he has a sense, I believe, that it does not foretell good news for him. 
He knows that if he calls the wise men and gives them the content of the dream this time, that they should be able to give him an interpretation. And in doing so, um, they're going to tell him what he wants to hear. If for no other reason, out of fear that if they give him the straight up truth and it's bad, <laughs> bad news to the king, he's going to have him executed. So he's going to tell them what he wants to hear. In contrast, he knows that he's going to get the plain, unfiltered truth from Daniel. And he doesn't want to hear it. He's afraid of it. He's afraid of the truth. Don't know that for certain, but it could be. And if that's the case, if that is anywhere near the reason, then there's an indication he's under conviction. Lost people under conviction, when they see the preacher, you know, they, they've gone to church, the preacher preached the message, gave an invitation, the lost person's under conviction of the Holy Spirit, they, they don't pray the sinner's prayer, they don't go forward and, and pray. Um, and then the next day, Monday, out and about, they see the preacher in public. The preacher doesn't see them, but they see the preacher. What are they going to do? If they're under conviction, they're going to run and hide from the preacher. They're going to run and hide. They're going to make sure the preacher doesn't see them. They do not want to talk to that preacher because he's going to ask them questions, and, and they don't want to revisit that conviction of the Holy Ghost. They, they don't want to be reminded of their sin and their destiny without Christ. And I think that's what's happening here with Nebuchadnezzar. Okay. Then came in the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, and I told the dream before them. So he's giving them the content of the, green, the dream. And this is amazing. It says, but they did not make known unto me the interpretation thereof. It didn't say they could not. It says, they did not. Why do you suppose that? Isn't that interesting? So he tells them the content of the dream, but they did not. I think it's because they knew it was bad news. They knew that if they told the king what they what was clearly the interpretation, they'd be dead men. They also knew that if they came up with a complete fabrication, <laughs> he'd probably have them killed for doing that. And so I think of the Jewish religious leaders when Jesus came to them and said, the baptism of John, from whence is it? From heaven or of men? And they huddle up with each other and they say, now if we say it's of heaven, they're going to say, well, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of men, then all the people are going to be enraged and they're going to stone us. So their response to Jesus was, we don't know. We don't know. I think that's what's happening here. All right. Um... Let's see where we're at. Time check. Uh, we're going to have to stop it right there, folks. We're going to have to stop it right there. Let's go ahead and read verse 8 and conclude. But at the last, Daniel came in before me, whose name was Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and before him I told the dream. So he does call Daniel, but only as a last resort. So I, I really do think he's under conviction. I do. But he wants to hear the interpretation. If it's as bad as he thinks it is, he wants confirmation of that. And he especially wants to know that if it isn't as bad as he thinks it is, and he knows Daniel's going to give him the truth, so he eventually gives in and calls on Daniel. All right, we'll have to stop it there, and we'll pick up at verse 8 next time. All right, folks, uh, before we go, speaking of conversion, we've been talking about Nebuchadnezzar's conversion, God's patience with him throughout all of it. 
And there may be somebody listening to me right now. God's been patient with you. He's let you live all the way up until this point without putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the plain and simple truth is, is that every one of us is just one breath away, one heartbeat away from eternity. And we're living in the last days, and the Lord Jesus Christ can come back at any moment. And based on what the Bible teaches, my friend, if you don't receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, given the amount of of truth you've already been exposed to in this country, in the life that you've lived in this country. Following the rapture of the church, if you're not saved, there is no hope for you. The Bible says that you're going to be given strong delusion, that you're going to believe a great lie that is coming, and you're going to end up worshiping somebody that you're going to think is the true and living God, when in fact it's the devil incarnate. You don't want that to be you. You don't want that. The Bible very clearly points out the urgency and importance of being saved. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. And so I implore you that if you've never trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you do so right now. In order to be saved, you just, you just need to be- believe that you're a lost sinner in need of salvation. The Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 6.23, the first part of the verse says the wages of sin is death. And so, yes, the bad news is we are all guilty sinners under the penalty of death, both physical death and eternal death, which is separation from God in a place called hell. Revelation 21.8 says the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So, yes, we we need to believe we're lost and on our way to hell before we can get saved. Do you believe that? The Bible clearly teaches it. Well, then there's the good news. The good news is, is that God loved you and me so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to pay that penalty, that death penalty, for you and me. He bore our sins on the cross 2,000 years ago and paid that price. He died spiritually. He died physically. And his resurrection is proof positive that his offering of his very soul for our sins has been accepted by God as payment in full for all of our sins. He has complete victory over death, hell, and the grave for you and for me. And so all we have to do now is just simply believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and will be saved. To admit that we've sinned, to be sorry for our sins, believe that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, and ask him to save us and forgive us of our sins. Here's the scripture attesting to that, Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And Romans 6.23, the last part of the verse says, But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So because Jesus has paid the price in full for you and me, God is offering eternal life to you, to me, to anyone and everyone, as a free gift. We just need to put our faith and trust in Jesus to receive it. It's the gift of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Are you willing to do that? Acts 16.31 says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And so if you're willing to do that tonight, then pray with me right now. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, I confess that I am a lost sinner, and I do not want to go to hell. I am so sorry for all of the sins that I've committed against you in my life. I believe that you sent Jesus to die in my place, and that He did die on the cross for all of my sins and rose again. 
And Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me so much to pay that awful price for me. And I believe you can save me, and you will if I ask. And so the best way I know how, I'm asking you to forgive me of all of my sins and come into my heart and my life and save my soul. I am trusting what you did to get me to heaven. Not anything I've done or anything I'll ever do, but you, Lord Jesus, and you alone, your death and your resurrection. Help me to live for you. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer and meant it, the Bible says in Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The moment you called upon him in faith, he saved you. You have his word on that. All right, folks, our time has come and gone. We're going to take a break this upcoming week for Memorial Day holiday. Spend some time with family, and I hope that you'll be able to get the opportunity to do the same. We'll be back in two weeks with new lessons, Lord willing. So until then, study to show yourselves approved unto God. Put on the whole armor of God and be steadfast, unmovable, and always abound in the work of the Lord. The Lord is coming back soon, folks. We're looking for him. We love you. We're praying for you. We'll leave you with a little bit more of the Swore family. He will hold me fast. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.